I have to often explain, almost apologize, why most of my scholarly work to date has focused on individual architects and their work. It seems that while traceable to Vasari, the biographic format is no longer considered a serious <coughs> scholarly pursuit. <coughs> the downfall of the format began in the mid 20th century when historians like Sigrid Gideon and Bruno Sevi started to promote their ideological agendas by singling out individual architects. On the left, we see an illustration from the Alto chapter of Space, Time, and Architecture um, from 1949 uh, that established him as part of the canon. Another right, uh, no, on the left, on the right, uh, Sevi's uh, book on Frank Lloyd Wright. As a result, architectural biographies now suffer from a major image crisis representing both the kind of non-historical history writing, which presumably overlooks the complex historical and contextual factors that shape architecture, as well as kind of anti-theory theory, ideological rather than critical in its treatment of ideas and themes embedded in the work. To counter these perceptions, I want to make, take this opportunity to make a case for architectural biography and its future, because I believe that an individual life can provide a rather useful tool, stable datum, against which to trace the complexities, including chance encounters and what-if scenarios that characterize history in the making, as well as to register the fluctuations and delays of life as lived. In order to take the format seriously requires accepting a sense of humanity and identity in the making, here we must be reminded that identity does not lay outside actions, but is realized only through them. Similarly, it requires that we overcome the false dichotomy between architecture and culture at, last, at large. As Bruno Latour puts it, quote, is not society built literally, not metaphorically, of goods, machines, sciences, arts, and styles, unquote. So understood, architecture, existence, and culture become one. Since, my recent, since in my recent book, Alvar Aalto, Architecture, Modernity, and Geopolitics, architecture is viewed through life of a man and of a nation, I will use the book as an example. Importantly, the book breaks loose from the canonical monographic format that organizes Aalto's life in an inevitable progression the promise of early childhood is tested in early career and matured in later life. While acknowledging that he was a gifted individual, I wanted to avoid the mystification that characterized much of Aalto's scholarship, including the essentialism surrounding Aalto's finishness. As the title indicates, the book is framed thematically and situates Aalto in a broad terrain of geopolitics, countering the benign imagery that governs perceptions of both Aalto the man and Finland the country, we must be reminded that Aalto's life and career evolved unpredictably in unpredictable times. Like all Finns, his life was affected by the dramatic events that define the 20th century Europe and Finland. The civil war following the declaration of independence in 1917, the Second World War, which led to the two respective Finno-Russian wars and the Cold War. Wait a second. My slides are not in order. Aalto used various geographic narratives, ideas about national, international, regional, and universal architecture to make sense of these events and their impact. Respectively, a cosmopolite, a cultural critic, an entrepreneur, a head of the Reconstruction Agency, and eventually the de facto state architect, Aalto's relationship to his home country was complicated and changed in time. To be sure, Aalto did not stuck in the woods of Finland, but traveled constantly the destinations of his trips tellingly, and this is important for my argument, were sympathetic to the national interest in the politically challenging time. Travels to the Baltic regions were followed by trips to Scandinavia, Germany, Switzerland, and subsequently US, 
as the Second World War put an end to the European modernist experiment and his home, home country at risk. Alto's career, and reception, Alto's career and reception is inseparable from these historical events. In many cases, these influenced the type of commissions he received. The two pavilions presented at, respectively at the Paris and New York World's Fair at the eve of the Second World War in late 30s were such instances. The latter pavilion was actually used to gain American sympathy and humanitarian aid during the Winter War of 1939 and its aftermath. The first international commission, the Baker House <coughs> at MIT, came tellingly from the US, the self-proclaimed leader of the free world after the Second World War, hence the free, war, free form. West Germany, desiring to de reinvent itself after the war along similar lines, became a repeat client. His last building in Finland housed the 1976 European Security Summit, which goal was to put an end to the Cold War. It's actually Gerald Ford addressing the summit. Likewise, Alto's reception is inseparable from these historical events. His ascendancy to international fame runs parallel to the rise of totalitarianism in Europe, which made Gideon in 1933, on the left, the postcard, to declare <coughs> to Alto that he was one day to become their Margus, their Nordens, the magician from the north. Gideon actually wrote the first version of the Aalto chapter for space, time, and architecture after the outbreak of the so-called continuation war between Finland and Russia in 1941. Aalto was subsequently singled out, or actually before that already, for a retrospective at MoMA in 1938, actually the first uh, kind of major single architect retrospective in MoMA. Um, where he was celebrated as the proponent of the individualistic and national approach to architecture. This at the time when internationalism of any kind had become synonymous with totalitarianism. Tracing down his powerful network of friends and clients, mapping out his travels and speculating about the motivations behind his actions led me to conclude that Aalto was more political than previously given credit. He was political in the most common sense of the word. He understood that social relationships are political. He liked to befriend powerful people. Clockwise from the top, he's seen here with Siegfried Gideon, perhaps the most powerful man within the modern movement. Harry Gulliksen, the CEO of Finland's largest corporation at the time. And Urho Kekkonen, Finland's long-standing president during the Cold War. Through my study, I grew also convinced that Aalto's personality, his charisma, likability, ambition, and his larger-than-lifeness were key to his architectural achievements. People liked him wherever he went, and by 1930, at the age of 32, he was a full member of the web of architects, artists, and critics that formed the European modern movement, an amazing achievement for somebody who came from a relatively unknown country. His language skills opened many doors. In addition to Finnish and Swedish, he was fluent in German, French, English. He also knew, spoke Latin, Italian, and Russian. And Dimitri Porfumio has told me that he even spoke some Greek as well. Alto's intellectual and personal malleability emerged as a dominant theme in this story. Symptomatically, his architectural ideas changed often depending on the intellectual and political context he was operating from. Even a single formal trope, as I show here, the curvilinear form, went through alterations and meaning of use through history. I tr trace uh, the different uses and, and, uh, and moments uh, and the meanings given to those forms. It is even difficult to pinpoint what motivates a single use of the free form. I find these um, images quite telling, because if you try to pinpoint him what the free form really means, you can say it might be a functional motivation of form. It might be just a free kind of uh, autonomous writing or sketch. Or on the left, he gives himself in the original sketch uh, 
of symbolic mean calling them Eskimo women's breaches. Um, so it's this sort of floating signifier of sorts. I found similar transformations and ambiguities in how Finland, the country, navigated the complex geopolitical terrain between East and West. To be sure, not only has the country's physical boundaries, but also its international role, role changed many times over. Like there are many Altos, I would argue there are many Finlands. I came to see Alto as the perfect Finn, exactly in the sense that he was a true real politiker, somebody willing to adjust his works and words to the constantly changing social and geopolitical landscape. Both the man and the country could thus be considered bricoleurs par excellence, making do of any given situation rather than pushing absolute goals and objectives. As I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, biography at best can offer an opportunity to overcome the false dichotomy between architecture, culture and politics through a close look at individual actions and the artifacts. Following Latour, I believe cultural artifacts cannot be reduced to physical objects, but are in fact inseparable of a broader cultural and political sphere. This cover of a literary magazine, Nuori Voima, from about 10 years ago is telling. It suggests that the Alto Vase has become Finland and such an integral part of the national unconscious. In conclusion, I would like to consider individual agency agency which lies at the heart of the biographic project. Reading modernity and self-identity, in which Anthony Giddens calls modernization and individual actions as the quote, two extremes of extensionality and intentionality, which define modernity, unquote, convinced me that what appears merely to be all those personal traits were actually symptomatic or are actually symptomatic of modern subjectivity at large. For Giddens, modernity is not reducible to an abstract economic and social sub superstructure. It must be understood as a condition that forces individuals to make choices, take risks, and thereby to transform existing conventions. In other words, modernity as a condition gains meaning and is understood only through individual actions and agency. Stylic, stylistic questions aside, this ability to act out and represent various large-scale historical and geographic narratives as they were unfurling makes Aalto, in my mind, one of the most modern architects of the 20th century. The idea that Aalto achieved his self-realization through actions and engagement with other human beings and the world around summarizes my argument to his work and persona vis-a-vis -vis large and historical and social events. Hannah Arendt offers guidance how to make sense of how to think about individual action when we consider a human being as being part of many. <coughs> she writes, quote, action, the only activity that goes on directly between men without the intermediacy of things or matter, corresponds to the human condition of plurality, to the fact that men, not man, live on the earth and inhabit the world. While all aspects of the human condition are somehow related to politics, this plurality, especially, especially the condition, not only the condition sine qua non, inalienable condition, but the condition per quam, condition through which of all political life. One could conclude that Aalto's architecture and actions did not simply respond to historical events, but are the very stuff culture and politics are made of. I recently got another opportunity to think about how to make sense of individual agency in the new political and economic landscape that has, has emerged in America since all those times, namely the constant instability of the late modern post-industrial world when conducting research for my latest book project, ex an exhibition project, Kevin Roche Architecture's Environment, which is currently at display at Yale. How indeed does an individual operate in the world no longer dominated by ideological debates and stable shared cultural symbols, but marked by even more unstable set of actors, alliances, and values. 
What does it indeed mean to be an architect when architecture is controlled by donors, middlemen, real estate agents, rather than with patrons and other individual visionaries? These are the key, these are the key problems that the profession tries to grapple with still today. I am happy to share what I learned from that project in the discussion that I hope will follow. Thank you.